And, and I'm just going to say ready. Ready. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Dayton Unit NAACP general meeting slash town hall meeting that will be sponsored by our chair of the Economic Development Committee. Tonight's topic is the economic state of Black America and building financial wealth, colon, bitcoins. We do know that investment in the Black community is a subject that needs to be lifted up. And certainly investment and investment opportunities are something that we need more information about and we need to engage in. Tonight's uh, topic is going to be moderated by Chairman Roland Winburn. He will introduce the guests for tonight. So sit back, relax, enjoy the information. And I'm sure Mr. Winburn will share with us how questions will be accepted and processed tonight. So again, Chairman Winburn. And thank you and good evening to everyone who's on this uh, video virtual video this evening uh, regarding the economic state of Black America and building financial wealth for Bitcoins. Um, we're going to first discuss uh, the aspect of Bitcoins uh, with our guest speaker. But before I say that, I want to say to everyone is that um, we are going to introduce a discussion of Bitcoins for your education. And it's not going where the, the NAACP chapter or myself are not promoting that you go out and engage in Bitcoins, but this is for your understanding and education. Uh, that is to, to expose you to Bitcoins, finances, investments, and so forth. I've asked Mr. Micah Dixon uh, to, to be that presenter tonight. I would like to share a little bit about Mr. Dixon. Um, Mr. Dixon is the founder of uh, Drivey Technologies. Uh, he is the founder and uh, in, in the organization is in Cincinnati, Ohio. He is past uh, previous uh, employment has been as a senior advisor with Cincinnati U USA Regional Chamber, uh, uh, Fifth Third Bank as a community business lender, uh, and other financial uh, positions as well as a financial writer and an analyst and tax preparer. He's also served as a member of the Jasper Brown Investment Firm in Vandalia, Ohio, where women and veterans uh, own businesses. Um, he helps to create these minority businesses. Uh, Mr. Mike, if I didn't mess that up too much, and if you want to add more, I'll let you, uh, would you please do that with us and, and express to me uh, additional things about your background, if you like. Yeah, absolutely. So I've been in, you know, financial services and corporate finance for well over a decade, uh, working with businesses of all sizes. Uh, currently, what Drive Technology does is we provide um, automation for back office service, services, especially uh, for financial services and banking. Um, and then we also uh, help advise companies around financial technology as well. Thank you. Um, we are adjusting the presentation tonight. Earlier, we were going to talk about the economics of Black America, but we're going to do that after this presentation due to time. Um, one of the transitions I was going to talk about was uh, the African-American economics uh, in real facts. Black families are more confident about achieving the American dream than the general population. However, African-Americans fall short on executing life-changing measures such as accumulating wealth, being better, better prepared for retirement and building up savings. Many African-Americans don't have tangible assets needed to make those goals realized. The study revealed a disconnect between African-American financial situations and their hopes toward the future. The report disclosed some pitfalls tied to African-American personal finances, including high debt, low savings, and a lower likelihood of wide financial product and ownership. In turn, the financial disparities and the wealth gap possibly explain why 31% survey are convinced the American dream may be fading away. Some key findings from the survey outside of retirement accounts, only 37% of African-Americans own wealth building products such as stocks and mutual funds. The study shows Amer African Americans want to improve their financial situation and are hopeful about the future, as said by Evan Taylor, American African American market director for Mass Mutual. 
It sheds light on the financial struggle, struggle and inequality that the African American community continues to battle. There is a need for greater financial education and discipline for the whole family to achieve economic success. So this is some of the background as to why I've asked Mr. Dixon to just discuss with us Bitcoins. There's so much information out there. A lot of people are not understanding. They're confused. They don't know if they want to invest. Some of the articles on our daily news show that Bitcoins are, are problematic. They're up one day and down the next. There's a lot of validity in, uh, in that. And that uh, Mr. Dixon, I hope will be able to explain uh, some, uh, to some of us or all of us how Bitcoins uh, came about, uh, whether in all the aspects in and out and good and bad about Bitcoins and let you make up your own decision whether you want to invest or engage in Bitcoins. Mr. Dixon, I'm now gonna turn that over to you. Uh, for your discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Winburn. Um, so uh, Bitcoin is digital gold. Now, that's not the end of my presentation, but I want us to really think through what that means, right? So when we talk about Bitcoin, there are a couple aspects we need to keep in mind, right? So there's Bitcoin, there's the underlying technology that allows Bitcoin to exist, which is uh, blockchain technology. And we'll discuss all of this as we move forward. And then there's wealth preservation and wealth creation, right? In order for us to put Bitcoin in the proper context, we need to understand why Bitcoin was created in the first place. Um, and that requires us to look at our current financial system. So our current financial system is very centralized, right? So we have central banks. So here in the US, it's the Federal Reserve. Um, you have the Bank of Japan, Bank of England. Um, all countries have their central bank. And what the central banking system does, is it um, dictates the amount of money that's in the economy, how that money flows through the economy. Um, the Treasury Department, along with the Fed, regulate our banks. And that's true almost around the world. Um, this has its problems, right? So we're all living through this inflationary period. Um, many would blame the Fed for printing too much money. Um, I'm not here to debate um, the causes of inflation, but at the end of the day, inflation is caused by too much money following too few assets or goods. Whose fault that is? That's for other people to debate, but that's the reality of the situation. This is due to decisions made by central bankers to print money, to print money and to provide liquidity or more money into the system. Bitcoin was created by those who um, fundamentally disagree with having individuals with all of their motives and biases, make decisions around uh, the banking system in, around the world, right? Now, I'm not advocating for this or, or not, but this we have to understand the mentality of those who created Bitcoin. So if you think about, so in 2008, right after the financial crisis, or in the midst of the financial crisis, I should say, a white paper came out by uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. Nobody knows who this man is. Um, people believe it's a pseudonym. People will try to identify him, um, but we don't know who he is. Um, he's anonymous. But the white paper introduced a concept of how can you allow for economic activity and wealth creation and really the movement of goods and services and the payment of those good, for those goods and services without having government or central banks in the middle of it. Now, if you look at our current system, if you were to go to the bank and say, hey, look, I want to see every deposit and withdrawal that has gone through the bank, not just mine, everyone's, you'd be laughed out of the office, right? Because we want to keep the privacy of those who are depositors of the bank. Well, 
Bitcoin flips that on its head in this way. It says you can see all of the transactions that have happened, but you can't know who those transactions were between, but you can know those transactions happened, right? And we do those, and how we know who gave money to who is just based on a number, we call it a wallet. So you can perfectly trace how a transaction has gone. And it decentralizes that ledger, if you will, so that not one entity or one person or a small group has control over how money is moved around the world. It's complex on how it does it, but basically there are nodes all across. So the more people are involved with Bitcoin in the network, the more secure the network is. You have thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of parts of this node that are interacting with each other. There is no computer system in the world yet that can hack into over 60% of those nodes, right? In order to control the network, you would need to control the majority of the nodes. It's almost impossible to hack the system. Um, there is emerging technology, but that emerging technology is only in the hands of three countries, the United States, Russia, and China, and even they aren't at the point where they could hack into the system and the bigger the system gets, the harder it is to try to control it. The point of it is to give the individual true economic sovereignty over their money. Now we're in the US, we are incredibly blessed to live in a system that um, we have pretty clear regulatory rules. Um, there is good give and take uh, among the people who have different viewpoints on what to do with the economy. But where this really is impactful is countries like Venezuela or Zimbabwe, where you don't really have a say in what happens with the monetary policy. There is no voting for a new leader to bring in new monetary policy. So if I want to kind of opt out of the current system, Bitcoin allows me to do that. And it puts it in a place where the government can't come and take it from me arbitrarily. And that's because, so this is a, I don't know if you can see it, and I have no problem showing you this. So this is my Bitcoin wallet. It's a hardware wallet. If this were to be stolen, not a big deal. Because in order to get access to my Bitcoin, they would need to know my 10 word security sentence, which lives in my head, not anywhere else. So this can be stolen. The government can say, we want you to turn over your Bitcoin. They have no way of getting to it unless they get what's in my head. This allows people to move across the world and still have their wealth travel with them. This type of security, like once again, we live in a country where we don't necessarily have to worry about that as an issue, but for countries where that is an issue, this is a game changer. And to be frank, we're also seeing real use cases around the security. So once again, I'm gonna ask you to take away the political lens and let's look at it objectively. I'm gonna bring up some, some um, current situations that we all are probably familiar with. So remember the uh, truckers protest in Canada. Canada had passed some regulations around vaccines for truckers. Those truckers had gone to the Capitol to protest and the government wanted them to leave. And in order to cause that to happen or to force people to leave, they began to freeze bank accounts and freeze assets so that there was an economic price to the protesters who were there. If you had Bitcoin, the government couldn't freeze anything. I could still transact with someone else who wanted to transact with me with Bitcoin. We're seeing this with the Dutch farmers currently as in, they are protesting 
regulations that have come down from the Dutch government um, around farmers. So these farmers, some of their farms are older than the United States, right? And they've been in the family for generations. So they're protesting and they're moving their cash into Bitcoin so that the Dutch government cannot freeze their bank accounts and they still have access to some type of money. We're also seeing this being used by citizens in Russia. Think of all the sanctions that have gone, um, that we've put on to the Russian government and, the, and the, the nation of Russia. If I'm a citizen, I can still transact with anyone around the world as long as I have access to Bitcoin and access to my wallet, right? From an objective point of view, you are giving the individual sovereignty over their wealth and their assets. Now, is this a good hedge against inflation? I think Bitcoin is still trying to figure that out, right? Because part, part of the thesis is, well, if the government is printing money, I can go into Bitcoin and not have that affect me. I don't know if we're quite seeing that play out. But at the fundamental level of why Bitcoin was created, we are seeing that play out in real ways. Now, that's, that's for wealth protection, wealth preservation, but we wanna talk about wealth creation, right? And that's where I think the conversation shouldn't be around Bitcoin, but it should be around the underlying technology, which is blockchain. So what blockchain does is it allows for a perfect record of who owns what that cannot be tampered with. So that allows and opens up the doorway for all types of ways for people to invest in assets. Because at the end of the day, wealth boils down to ownership and assets. If you look at the, the economic state of Black America, you can trace that back historically to when African Americans were shut out of owning assets that create wealth. What blockchain allows us to do is to own assets that no one can, can dispute that we own using this technology. And that's where I think the wealth creation comes in because it opens up the doorway for me to own my data. So if you have a cell phone or you're surfing the internet, there's a bunch of data you're creating. And right now you don't own that data. It's owned by Google, it's owned by Facebook, it's owned by somebody else. And they're making money off of your data. Blockchain allows for there to be a trace back to you as the owner of that data. So I'll give you a real world example of how this is happening. So there's a, there's a browser called, an internet browser called Brave Browser. Now they don't block ads, but what happens is you get paid a portion of the money that they are paid when an ad is displayed to you automatically. And at the same time, let's say I'm going to someone's website and I'm reading a lot of their articles or I'm watching a lot of their videos. They will also get paid from me automatically for their content. We don't need to enter into some big contract with lawyers and everything like that. We can, we've entered into this agreement just by using the same platform that we've agreed to the rules of, and now they're able to make money from making, from creating content. I'm able to make money with my data and my eyeballs, right? I have true ownership over that, right? Now we talk about raising capital for buying assets. And I think this is where those who are politically minded need to be very, very wise. We have laws around um, high net worth individuals that precludes anyone who is not a high net worth individual to invest in certain assets. 
So if I wanted to invest in a startup or an investment fund that wanted to go invest in small businesses or invest in real estate, there are laws around me being able to invest because I'm not a high net worth individual, right? There are very stringent rules around that. What Bitcoin, what, sorry, what blockchain allows us to do is to be able to trace the ownership back and set rules, automatic rules that are set in the code that can protect consumers, can, can protect investors, and make sure that everything is abiding by regulation. If we're smart about regulation and laws, the Jobs Act that passed uh, under President Obama was a great step forward towards this when it came to things like crowdfunding, but we have the ability to do more. This technology is gonna allow us to do that and automate it. Um, I sit on the board of uh, the Cincinnati Music Accelerator where we teach artists how to make money creating and playing music. The big part of it is royalties, right? Your song gets picked up on a commercial or used someplace else. If you don't have it set up properly, you may not get paid your royalties or you're relying on some middleman to make sure you get paid your royalties. Blockchain through using the code, I don't need a middleman. It'll automatically say, hey, this belongs to this artist and they should get paid for it and will automatically get paid for it. Real estate projects. So as, we're ra as people are raising money to invest in real estate, you could begin to crowdfund for real estate projects. And there's some of this already happening. And now I can take a small portion of what I want to invest with, take some risk with, invest in this. And by using the blockchain, it can tell exactly who owns what, when someone gets paid. Let's say the person you invest with is a bad actor. They can't violate the code. So they can try to, but if the code is written properly, they can't avoid still paying you, right? You're getting your money back. Now, this still goes into due diligence and making sure that what's in the code actually um, uh, abides by certain rules set forth. But there's a lot of opportunity in blockchain. Bitcoin, think of it almost like your phone, right? So your phone, there are apps on your phone, and then there's just the operating system. Bitcoin is an app on the phone. Blockchain is the operating system. Blockchain allows there for there to be apps. And so that's where I think the future is. And you know, if you look at what's happening currently in the market, you know, there's uh, a lot of volatility, but also keep in mind what happened with the dot-com boom and bust, right? So during that time, if you put dot-com behind anything and went public, everybody wanted to buy it, right? And then that bubble burst and a lot of people lost money. Um, a lot of things went out of business, but it didn't make the internet not a real thing, right? This, this what's happening right now is a product of the internet and those who continue to have good products and innovate. So what we're, what's happening right now is there's a bust going on and we're separating the wheat from the chaff, right? who's real, who's a pretender, who doesn't have a good product, that's being separated out right now. But that doesn't mean that this isn't going to be the future. And so when we think about wealth creation, think about ownership and blockchain allows there to be true ownership that can be traced back to you, to your family, and you get to decide what happens with that. And if it's done properly, it can actually be a way of passing down wealth generation to generation without having to try to find paperwork. So I, my, my great grandfather did all he could to accumulate assets. So he's investing in this, investing in that, 
somebody gave me a big bag full of paperwork of all the things he was investing in. Some of the paper was tattered, some of the paper was torn, didn't even know where, how to trace it back to, to what company. Blockchain eliminates that because you can truly trace it back to the owner and the source. And so that's when I think of, of wealth creation, it's about ownership and it's about this technology enabling ownership. Happy to, to take questions. This was so much, Mr. <laughs> Dixon. Um, I'm just sitting here thinking that I need three Gen Zers sitting beside me to help me process this because, um, you know, certainly I can see this is certainly going to be the way for we're past millennials, as I said, Generation Zers. Mm -hmm. um, when you say that, uh, how do they trade? Uh, you mentioned about um, if. Indeed, I wanted to move some Bitcoins. Share with me, how does it translate to the tangible? You know, yep. for me actually getting a service or a project in, you know, as a result of my trading. Yeah, so, there, so there's two ways, right? So one way is on an exchange. So think of it almost as a, a, um, an E-trade or whatever for cryptocurrency. The... The good thing about that is it makes it easy to do and easy to move it around. I can move it from that um, exchange into my bank account for dollars or whatever, right? The problem with that is that it does still fall within the centralized financial system, right? So if it depends on what you're using it for, right? If you're using it to speculate and maybe make a little bit of money, then you can use the exchange. But if you're trying to use it for the purpose of, I want some money, just like having a gold bar in your house or money under the mattress, except you can actually use it and carry it around, that's when we talk about this hardware wallet, right? Doing transactions between people, it's just you and I, saying, here, send Bitcoin to this address for this service. That's really all it is, right? And so I, on your computer, literally, it'll say, it'll say, paste the address of where you want to send the Bitcoin, and I can do that, right? As long as you have the address. Um, when it comes to exchanging it for services, so there, there are things like, um, just like you would online shopping, there are plenty of places that are offering Bitcoin as a payment option. And that's where you would use your Bitcoin wallet to be able to do that, right? So I would say start with the exchange like you would with a, a stockbroker, put money in there. I would buy Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, and just buy a little bit of it, right? I think the thing about this environment is that tinkering and figuring things out is going to be incredibly valuable. But that means doing it in a way that's, um, that's proportional to what you can risk, right? So it could be, I'm going to take $100 and buy $100 worth of Bitcoin with it, right? And I'm going to purchase something that under $100 where they take Bitcoin. And going through that experience will show you that you're using Bitcoin just like you do your credit card or anything else, right? And that will give you that exposure over time. So I think start with the exchange of so things like Coinbase, um, Kraken, uh, there's Binance. These are all exchanges that you can deposit money onto, buy Bitcoin or Ethereum. And then I would just you know try to find a retailer that has a product or service um, that you'd like to purchase or use and buy it with Bitcoin. Just do it one time and go through that experience. Um, and you'll see how low the barrier is to entry around it. Did that answer your question? That makes sense? It did, it did. And it led me to a follow-up question, but I'm going to yield to see if someone else has a question before I do my follow-up question. 
Okay, hearing none. So did I understand you to say that at present, there's no regulatory agency, there are no regulatory procedures or processes. So it's not like there can be a challenge for illegality or legality. This is all kind of on, if you will, like, a, 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 I don't want to say dark web, that doesn't fit at all. But <laughs> no, I know that doesn't fit. Or, but it's just kind of like um, an electronic waves, you know, things happening across the wire, so to speak. Yeah, so we're in a very interesting time where governments are trying to figure out how they're going to regulate this, right? So the big decision that came down a couple of weeks ago, or I think it was last week, um, was that uh, the SEC and the Fed said, hey, look, we're going to see this more. We're going to see Bitcoin as a currency. And so that's for the comptroller of the U.S. to figure out the regulation around that. There are other, there are things like cryptocurrencies, which is going to, it's confusing, but if you look at how they function, they function more like how stocks and securities function. And the SEC has been quick to begin to regulate those cryptocurrencies because of how they function, right? So all the dust hasn't settled yet. I will say that we've seen examples of if I'm participating, actually, so this idea that Bitcoin can only be used for illicit activity. I'm not saying you're saying that. I'm, I've heard the argument, right? I mean, one of the, the main uses of the US $100 bill is for corruption in the world, right? So currency is going to be used for illicit activity, no matter what. Actually, Bitcoin is easier to trace and build a case around if somebody's participating in illegal activity and you can find out what their wallet number is, right? Through subpoena or them being sloppy with their record keeping. You can then create a case around that illegal activity because they because there's a true record of what's happening, right? Now, getting access to that um, Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, that's where there's difficulty, right? That's where there can be some serious difficulty in doing it. And we're still, that's still shaking out on exactly what that's going to look like. But I would say we're going to see more regulation. So it's not, I wouldn't say it's the wild west. I mean, a couple of years ago, I would say, yes, it's the wild west. Now we're starting to see governments have opinions around it and begin to put some regulatory framework around it. Um, but I, I would still say you have to use caution as you enter into this. That's why I say start with an exchange because there are just protections around that. Um, but as you get into things like hardware wallets and some other things, that's where you know there's still a lot of gray area. Micah, if I may, uh, Maddie, if I may. Yep. Okay. Uh, my question is, it sounds like it's that we would necessarily have to get off the sideline and begin to invest in some kind of way at a small level so that you can experience the different transactions and the, your experiences will then only uh, build after you do those small investments and uh, you reap the rewards of doing that or get your purchases as you design, as you determine that you want it to do. So it sounds like um, um, beginning to do that is going to get you to have a better experience with Bitcoins or exchanges or or the uh, blockchains and so forth, the whole aspects around that. So I would say maybe an initial investment of $100 or something, make a purchase for under that amount. Uh, be comfortable with it, being able to put that amount out though. So if you do, uh, if you don't have positive experiences with that, it's okay. So anything that you do, you want to make sure that you have a budget and that you're willing to make that investment uh, in, into that. Um, so the other thing is, I'm not sure if I understand how we can build our wealth. And I know that there are some uh, examples of investing Bitcoins in Africa, for, ex for example, in terms of a new, uh, new uh, industry there, or new um, investing opportunities there. Can you share with me how I would be able to do that? So I, I would say when it comes to wealth building, this is, this is where 
when we talk about assets and raising capital, that's that's where we you, you need to start looking, right? So I think too many times we get caught up, should I buy Bitcoin to make money off of Bitcoin? And what I'm saying is blockchain in and of itself, right, is a way for us to crowd fund projects that build wealth. That's like being an investor or getting a uh, someone to invest in your idea or your project. Absolutely. And that and that's where I'm talking about the regulatory environment needs to be wise around how we give access to it. Because if we use the same regulatory structure we've used over the past couple decades, actually longer than that, around accredited investors and alternative investments, the only people that will make money through this new technology are going to be the people who are already wealthy. We need to be allowed to crowdfund projects, real estate, funding businesses, creating uh, economic opportunity by using this technology. That's where the wealth creation comes in. There are plenty of projects now that are using um, cryptocurrency and blockchain to fundraise, especially in the real estate area. Um, so there's things like crowdfund, which I don't think they're quite using blockchain. I think they're migrating to that, but they're using this idea of crowdfunding to do to buy real estate projects, and you get a return from that, right? And that boils down to ownership, and and that's going to create wealth is having that ownership in different uh, assets, even if it's partially owning an asset. Very good. Maddie, I don't know if we, I don't see anyone else who has um, submitted any questions. Is that correct, Scott? Do you see I, any? Yeah, I haven't I heard see, any. Yeah, I don't see any in the chat. I have chat. a question. This is okay, Clayton Thompson you. speaking. Thank you. And I don't know, hi, Maddie. I don't know, Micah, if I missed this part. So that $100 example, when would you suggest, like if I were to put a $100 investment into this Bitcoin, how will I know when to jump out, like when the loss is getting ready to happen? Because it's kind of like a stock at the same time, correct or not? So how would I know at what point? Do I just let the $100 sit there? Do I move? Like, how do I do that? So I, I, would, I would encourage you to look at it less as a stock investment and more like buying. Think of it, this is, think of it like buying a small bar of gold but you can still go and buy stuff with the gold, right? So you're not buying the gold to make a ton of money, right? You're buying the gold as, an, as another way of being able to purchase things and to store wealth aside from having it in cash. And so that's where I'd say, so people who are speculating are gonna to wanna to know when the ups and the downs are. Right. You know, I would say, in my opinion, that's not the best way to try to build wealth. Building wealth is about the long term. And so this is a way of being able to offload some of your wealth off of the, the centralized financial system and putting it into something that um, allows for you to have more control over it. And, I, and I'll be completely transparent and honest about it. What I've built is, what I've talked about is the case that those who are all about 100% in on Bitcoin are making. I am a little bit more skeptical that it still hasn't proven its ability to do all of these things yet. So that's where I'm saying limit how much you're putting in there and do the research. Listen to someone who's completely you know, in on it and then others who are skeptical about it. But I would say, don't look at it as a stock or as a way to get rich quickly. It's more... It's a way to store wealth um, and have more control over that wealth. So, Michael, just to, Micah, just to be clear, so it's just money sitting. That hundred dollars would just be sitting there because it's not an investment. It's not stock. It's just sitting there. It's no interest or anything being built. It's just a way of putting money where the government can't see it. Correct. Correct. I, I would say that that's the the point of it is is that. It's not something that will be influenced by the decisions of the Federal Reserve. That's the theory behind it. Okay. So the way what you've described is what 
someone who would be called a Bitcoin maximalist would say is that if I put $100 of Bitcoin or buy $100 worth of Bitcoin, then no matter whether we have inflation or not, my money is preserved inside of Bitcoin. I like that, Mike. I heard you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. But, but right. Mike, excuse me, uh, Roland, I'm sorry. But Micah, I guess the conjunction to that would be, and I can take that $100, it could either be stationary or it can be mobile. Mm -hmm. And the mobility has to do with me securing goods and services. So Mm -hmm. I'm constantly, as you say, doing like an E-trade, but the value, my value stays there. Mm -hmm. And you know, that $100, but I'm constantly getting something for it depending upon the mobility of my choices for mobility. Yeah, so it, think of it at that point as just another form of money, right? If if you want to buy, if you say you have $100 worth of Bitcoin, you want to buy something that's worth $50 of Bitcoin from me, right? Then I provide you the product, you pay me $50 worth of Bitcoin. Just like you would with cash. Are you seeing, what uh, group of people in our community are you seeing really engaging and participating in this type of uh, uh, currency acquisition? So I I would say where I'm seeing a lot of activity just from my perspective are, you know, young African-American millennials, Gen Zers who are building incredible projects off of the underlying technology of blockchain. They're solving issues around people being underbanked or not banked. They're solving issues around raising capital. That's where I'm seeing a lot of really interesting projects that are happening. Um, And a lot of them are people who have maybe worked on Wall Street and left and have started these projects. So I think there's more excitement around the underlying technology because it will allow for us to solve a lot of financial issues that we see that have, you know, plagued not just our community, but communities around the world um, for decades. If, if one I more see, question. If I see that. One, so, one last question. Well, I'm sorry. While we're on that topic, though, I want to ask this. While we see that there are some interesting projects or venues that people are creating, That's where we can invest our money in those entrepreneurs, those newer entrepreneurs and their new projects. Would that be correct to say? That would be correct to say. But once again, that goes back to the, you know, I'm not a fan of the regulation around accredited investors. I think it is outdated. It is it it needs to be updated. And I'll blatantly say that I, I think it is it has insulated wealth to people who already have money. And that's where I think we have to say, let's figure out a way to not just to open it up for more investors to have access to those projects in a way that still protects the investor. That means that's why I talk about being wise, right? Figuring out the best way to do that. But yes, if you are able to invest in those type of projects, invest in those type of projects. If you're able to be a part of those, be a customer or consumer of those projects, be a customer or consumer because they're building financial products that are meant to help in things like do like things like increase credit score, give people access to um, owning pieces of real estate projects, or helping to crowdfund for small businesses. You may not be able to invest directly into into their business, but you can all but you can use their product to still build wealth and invest in the things that they're trying to raise capital for. Um, so that's another way to get involved. I know of a young person who said that um, a celebrity, Megan Thee Stallion, um, gave her Bitcoins. What's the probability of that being legitimate? Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I don't think no I don't answer. Know. You pretty much answered. Well, uh, no, I, I don't, because it from first blush, it doesn't sound legitimate, right? But at the same time, I mean, look at what's happening with Elon Musk and Dogecoin, right? Yeah. Like he has decided to start tweeting about it and and talking about it and it has affected that market, right? Um, And so celebrities are doing some interesting things using this technology. I would just say be very, 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 very careful 
because if they're if they're wanting you to give them uh, access to your wallet or to the exchange, then they can do all kinds of things, right? So just being very cautious sometimes, you know, many times if it's too good to be true, then, then it is. Okay. Patty, I know that we're about an hour into the presentation. So if there are no more questions, um, if no, no, one, no one of the committees, um, a chairman would like to ask Mr. Dixon any questions. I'm seeing Mr. Pollard. Uh, Mr. Pollard, any questions that you would have to ask of uh, Mr. Dixon? No, I, actually, I think he, he gave a good, honest, uh, you know, presentation and some good cautions uh, because just like everything else, you know, anything that's a get get rich quick, stock market, whatever, it's not going to happen for the everyday person. That's not how you're going to build wealth. You know, that's that's for the for the Warren Buffets and the people that's already got that money that can take that risk and they already got enough salted away. If they lose it, they're still okay because they'll get it back again because they know how to play the numbers. The numbers are in their favor uh, just because of what they have in their, in their wallets, the real wallets already. So I, I, I think he gave some good advice, you know, check it out, use it, see how it works and then see how it can work for you. And, you know, the, the, the groups working together, uh, helping each other to, to, uh, to build up businesses because in, in, in our communities, that's the problem. Most people don't even know what they don't know and they don't even know how to go to get that, that banking help or talk to the bankers if they do go, you know, if you, if you say the wrong thing, you automatically they already done shut you off and you don't even know it, but they give you the grip and the grin. You know, and then you leave and you get nothing. So I, I think it's very, very wise to to take it cautious because there's still a lot of unknown unknowns, as we would say in the in the project world, Oncox, unknown unknowns right now uh, in the Bitcoin world. But it it's got some possibilities based on how he described how you should use it. But because I had a nephew, he was he was contacting me and I says, you know. And you don't you don't you don't know enough of you much yourself to be talking about you're gonna go in there and jump into Bitcoin. You need to do some research and some studying and be very cautious because it's not a get rich scheme. It's it's just not. Thank you, Mr. Pollard. Uh, Maddie, at this time, uh, we will we can conclude the discussion on bitcoins. Uh, I hope everybody has uh, gotten a lot of education and advice about how you want to look at uh, bitcoins, how you might want to invest in a bitcoin. I think the overall walling uh, idea is to move cautiously um, and to pay attention to uh, Bitcoins. But if you want to invest, invest very little at this time and to see if you get the results back of what you want to do with your investments. So, uh, right. Micah, if that's correct, uh, any, any additional comments before we close? No, I would just say just take a couple bucks and try it out and and experience it and that's how you'll learn just take a small take a small amount and, and experience it and uh, see if it's for you if it's not then that's not a big deal either there thank you very much and if we were in an audience face to face right now i think that we would give you a good hand clap uh, but we all want to see it virtually uh, uh, to do that we want to thank you very much for giving of your time and your expertise tonight uh, in regards to bitcoins and how we might look at bitcoins as we proceed in the future Thank you so much. Appreciate you so much. Thank you. And we have Thank you, our sir. president. We have President Forward, Dr. Uh, Derek L. Forward, who is going to uh, close out this session. Okay, one other thing, Maddie. I think Scott has the, pre the original presentation that he can share with you in regards to the economics of, and state of Black America. Uh, I want to just show that slide. And we won't have to get into any detail that if, if people want to know more about that particular slide or, or information about Black America, um, I'm asking that they send their name and information that I can send the, the information to them. So Thank you. Scott, if you can show that uh, presentation, the uh, overview. Um, Mr. President, I got when I went to share my screen, it, it asked me about my preferences, which I'm not sure. It says only one can share at a time. 
Oh, what I could do then, uh, yeah. President or, and Scott, is I can make that available on the website. Yeah, we could do that. We can email and, it out. Uh, let people Everybody react can. to that. And if people want to have additional information or background information, I can make that available to them. Well, uh, let's let's do this then uh, for our viewing audience. Uh, let's see if I can open that slide up. And then if I can open that slide up in that way, they can see this uh, as they are viewing. So uh, let's do that. And, um, and then we'll go from there. So we'll share our screen and then we'll go there. So what is it that you'd like to see, Chairman uh, Wimber? Basically, the first uh, two, that one, it was the introduction. And then the next page uh, is the presentation that we were going to talk about tonight. And then the next one right after that. These are the, is the information that's showing the state of Black America in 2020, 21, and 22. Most people who collect data is a year or so behind in actually presenting a report. So if we can look at 2021, those shows the inequities in social and economic indicators. The, those uh, particular inequalities con continued in 2021, only deepening. And then in 2022, uh, we're looking at the president of the National Urban League who talked about how people are less likely to benefit from home ownership. Disparity with, is getting wider. Life exper expectancy has declined. Educational gaps abound. Experience in social justices um, has widened. And registering to vote is problematic for some of the young folks who don't see a need uh, to vote because they don't see the outcomes that they would like to have. So briefly, uh, you'll see that this is the information that was presented. We can go into some detail if you like, or, and by doing so, I can send that information to you. But this is a real quick overview of the disparities over the last couple of years um, and how it's impacting us with, uh, developing wealth, um, dealing with the disparities between education and income, uh, health, uh, education, and so forth. So if there is, uh, we can, you know, if you want to, you can send questions through the website. We'll make this available, and I can make the whole presentation to you available, available at another time. So that's it for tonight. Okay. All right. Thank you. And uh, I, I did notice on our call this evening, and what I'll really like to do, uh, maybe on a Saturday, uh, with Chairman Winburn, uh, because it's very important. Uh, you know, economic sustainability, economic uh, development, economic empowerment is very vital uh, to, to our organization as a whole, and it's very important for our constituents to understand uh, their economic dollars. So uh, we also have on the line with us this evening a Michael Grooms. And if uh, Mike Grooms can kind of share uh, just a little bit about what he does inside of his organization, uh, that would be greatly appreciated so that people can kind of know what it is that you do uh, from a financial empowerment standpoint. And then maybe on a weekend, uh, we could have another session regarding financial literacy, financial empowerment, and uh, Chairman Winburn will actually uh, moderate that session. So Mr. Grooms? Uh, thank you for that, uh, President Ford. I appreciate that. Um, again, my name is Michael Grooms, and I am a financial advisor with New York Life. Uh, what I work with is individuals and businesses to find solutions that basically form a uh, multi-package for them. So instead of a singular solution uh, to a need, I actually look for a way of being able to incorporate <laughs> several solutions into it. So for example, uh, the usage of life insurance, which goes, I believe, um, underused in the community. Uh, we do have life insurance and statistics that show that the community does use life insurance, but as far as the value of life insurance and getting enough insurance to cover our needs, a lot of times I'm pretty sure uh, people on the call have, have heard and seen where uh, GoFundMe is the primary source of <clears throat> of uh, funeral expenses and so in the uh, community. And a big part of that is uh, having a legacy available that will help with the economic sustainability within the community. So prime example 
um, as a former paralegal for 20 years, I worked on probate estates and discovered that generally when a, a black family has a probate estate, that estate is going to very rarely have life insurance with it. And it's usually going to be somewhere in the, the medium range of about $50,000. And a white family is going to end up having life insurance of at least 100000 or more that's going to pass on in a tax-free basis which helps to create that legacy for them and pass it on, as well as they'll have uh, assets that are gonna be somewhere in the 150 median range. Necessarily, uh, that's not indicative of the uh, understanding of what's taking place in the community, as we do know that we do have uh, less income coming into the community, but necessarily it talks about how we can utilize the income that is coming in and show people how to maximize the usage of that income so that they can start to grow that uh, sustainable uh, legacy and passes on to the next generation. So that, that's what I, I generally focus on is working with individuals and businesses to create those um, strategies. Okay. All right, thank you very much. And then also uh, many of you may recall Reverend Dr. Uh, Robert E. Baines Jr. Uh, who was a former uh, president of the Dayton unit in AACP. Uh, he is also doing a financial literacy piece as well. Uh, so I just want to put that on uh, uh, Chairman Wimber's radar uh, that I would like for the, uh, him, uh, Reverend Baines and uh, Mr. Grooms to do a financial literacy workshop, uh, uh, you know, very soon on a Saturday and or a weeknight uh, during the day or a Saturday afternoon, you know, whatever it may be, because it's, it's very critical that we understand the power of our dollar. If we don't, if we're, if we're, you know, if we're not really understanding that and understanding about pre-planning on a lot of different things, then a lot of us are going to be in a world of hurt when we don't have to be. Uh, you know, I was at the grand opening today of, uh, you know, you know, down in right Dunbar where they have, four or five eateries, I forget exactly what it's called down there because I, you know, I, I didn't get the name of it, but there are several eateries on the inside of there. And uh, it looks like it's gonna be, does like it's gonna do very well uh, for the day community, especially down for the right Dunbar residents. And uh, hopefully we can have something like that on uh, in Northwest Dayton as well. Uh, but, uh, but it's a very nice facility and uh, they're <laughs> pooling their dollars together, their resources together. Uh, to have uh, basically you can say a multi-unit uh, food establishment in Wright Dunbar. And um, so whenever we can do things like that and get people to buy into your concept, uh, you know, and that's the good thing about having uh, Mr. Pollard on, on our economic development team because he's a business owner. Uh, he, you know, he, you know, he knows how to, you know, how to have a model and to make, make it be uh, successful. So that's, you know, we need to continue to promote financial literacy, financial empowerment, um, uh, you know, those type, types of things to, to, so our people will know uh, how to utilize their dollars, uh, you know, and that's gonna help benefit their families uh, for years ahead. Uh, so with that uh, next month, uh, we are going to be uh, in the month of August, uh, we are gonna have, uh, something that's going to be uh, for general membership in August is going to be on the education committee. So our education chair, which is Loretta Williams, uh, she will in fact uh, be spearheading uh, it, you know next month's community meeting focused on education. Uh, then in September, uh, we're going to go into political action. And then in October, uh, we were slated for housing. Uh, but we're going to have probably another political forum and or president's briefing in the month of October. Uh, so with that, uh, until the next time, uh, may God bless you. Well, well, no, I want to say before I say that, I want to say representative, representative, I'm going back to your old days, Representative Winburn. Uh, but Chairman Winburn, um, great job on putting this, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, this month community meeting together. Uh, we look forward to many more of these uh, down the road. Uh, you know, so we don't have to wait for a monthly community meeting because we only got 12 meetings out of, out, of a, out of a year. And in fact, we really only have 11 because in the month of December, we have our annual meeting. 
So really, we only have 11 months to try to get as much information to people as possible during a general membership meeting. But there are other, there are 300 some odd more days that we can educate people. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll see you next month. May God bless you. May God bless the NACP. And may God bless these United States of America. Good night, everybody. Love you, mama.